start with is an invitation to each of our uh, panelists to um, take about five minutes to introduce themselves uh, and describe a little bit about why you are here as part of this conversation on the connection between climate justice and poverty eradication. Uh, I will drop bios in the chat um, so that you don't need to go through too much of your backstory, uh, though you're of course welcome to share what you would like. And Tika, I think we're going to start with you. All right. Thanks so much, Carrie. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see a number of familiar uh, names in the chat in the uh, list of participants here and many who I don't know. So I'm really happy to join you today. Uh, my name is Tika Newton. I am the membership and domestic policy manager for Climate Action Network Canada. Um, for those who aren't familiar with Climate Action Network, um, we're a member based organization. We currently have about 120, a few more than 120 members across the country. They're all civil society nonprofits that share a common interest in fighting for climate action and climate justice. Um, we are largely a policy oriented organization, um, but we do have a number of members who work across all all parts of the climate movement um, from direct action to policy and everything in between. Um, my own background, uh, I came to the climate movement somewhat later in life um, and, uh, and I've been with CANRAC for the past three years now. Um, I initially started as a membership coordinator and convener and I now um, manage most of our activities within Canada. Um, I'm here today um, partly because CPJ is one of our really active and trusted members, um, but also because this ties into some work that Climate Action Network has been doing this year around just recovery. Um, so tapping into the strength of this large network, we've been able to talk to a number of organizations across uh, many different civil society sectors this year to talk about what it means to build back from this the series of crises that have hit us this year in uh, in Canada and globally. Um, and one of the things that we will discuss, I think, as we go on in this webinar today is just how many intersections there are among social justice issues. So climate change is so, sort of an overarching problem um, that a challenge that faces all of us. But there are other challenges and problems that have emerged from the very systems that have perpetuated climate injustices as well. Um, and some of those problems relate to food security, they relate to housing, they relate to employment, gender equity, racism. So all of these issues are all integrally linked together. And it, when we're fighting the climate battle to try to, to, to seek climate justice, it means pushing for a whole systems change. And that's the system that also needs to be changed to address all of those other issues. So I think we'll talk about that in more, uh, more depth as we go along, but that is what brings us here today. Fantastic, thank you, uh, Tika. I hid my uh, unmute button there for a second. Um, I'm going to jump ahead. Um, Natalie, if you can let me know when Brianna has joined us. Um, in the meantime, we I'd like to uh, invite Katie Perfit to say hello. You're still muted, Katie. Katie, I think you are still muted. Oh. There you go. Is it You're working now? Go. Okay, sorry. I have to do both my phone and the the computer here. Um, so yeah, thanks for everyone for joining and for uh, Carrie and Natalie and all, all the other panelists. Um, this is a really important discussion and I'm so glad to be a part of it today. Um, so I, uh, I'm with an organization called 350.org and we're a global organization that works uh, around the world in many different countries. Um, basically supporting uh, social movements in their fight against the fossil fuel industry and the financing of fossil fuel projects um, in order to uh, build the kind of uh, systems that we need in order to save our climate and protect our communities. And so here in Canada, that work looks a lot like um, supporting mobilizations, including Indigenous-led mobilizations against major fossil fuel projects, 
if you're on uh, more of the eastern side of Canada, we've been in, involved in fights against the Energy East pipeline. If you're uh, more on the west coast and the prairies, um, Energy East as well, but also the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain pipeline, um, Northern Gateway, and other um, Keystone XL pipelines. That's been uh, sort of, I guess, for a lack of a better saying, uh, the bread and butter of the 350 Canada team since we um, initially kicked off about um, just under 10 years ago in Canada. But really in the past, um, I would say like a couple of years, a lot of our focus has gone towards this really exciting, um, important conversation about what does the future look like when we've won uh, and made sure that we've kept fossil fuels in the ground, what are the kinds of um, massive transformations that we need. And so we got involved with the Green New Deal um, coalition that emerged uh, in the lead up to the federal election. And then of course, um, what Tika was mentioning, uh, the, the Just Recovery, this alliance of 500 organizations, we, we joined that um, really recognizing uh, the need for there to be a really collective response to what's happening with COVID and, and understanding that there are forces at play that want to take us in the opposite direction of a just recovery and wanting to really bring that social movement perspective that uh, 350 is really dedicated to um, in order to, yeah, to support that work. Um, what brings me personally to this, uh, really interesting, uh, Natalie and I have connections to the Ottawa Valley. so. I grew up um, in a town called Arnprior. I currently live in a smaller town nearby. Um, and I have, I guess my, my perspective and the way that I come to the climate movement is really from like a working class upbringing and always have found the climate movement to have a little bit of a class problem um, that when, when I joined about, you know, 10 years ago, it really felt like more of a undertaking that people with privilege were able to, to take on and really didn't see people like the people from my community, um, rural working people uh, in, in the climate conversation and certainly not in the solutions conversations. So that's really what motivates me um, in, in climate organizing. And I think there's, I'm really excited to be a part of this dialogue about how do we talk about economic justice um, in the context of climate change, because I think there's so much to be done there and it's, it's, an, it's a, a way that we really need to lean into this work in order to win. Thanks so much, Katie. Um, welcome, Brianna. We understand there were some Wi-Fi issues, so we're glad that you're here now. I'm going to uh, give you a minute to settle in uh, while we uh, hear from Dr. Samantha Green, a board member with Canadian, the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. So I'll pass it over to you, Samantha. Thank you. Hi, uh, and, and I'll just say I'm here with my six-week-old baby. So uh, if you hear some noises, it's little Florence over here. Um, so uh, thank you so much for inviting um, m me to, to speak on this panel. Um, I'm a family doctor in downtown Toronto and the majority of the work that I do is with people living in poverty, people experiencing homelessness and, and people living in Regent Park and St. Jamestown and Moss Park. So neighborhoods um, where there's a high proportion of people living in poverty. Um, and I've also been involved in the climate movement uh, for a long time since before I entered medicine. Um, and I have always seen, uh, like Katie said, that there's a bit of a class problem in, in the climate movement. And um, in my career um, as a physician, uh, I mean, I've seen the, the health effects of poverty and I've also seen already the health effects of climate change. And, and we know that, um, they intercept. So people who are living in poverty are much, much, much more vulnerable to the effects of climate change and the, in particular the health effects of climate change. So that's why I'm here. I guess I started with that um, rather than the organization. Um, uh, so CAPE, um, Canadian Association of Physicians uh, for the Environment is a, a coalition. It's an organization of physicians um, from across Canada um, working on all environmental issues, including pesticides, um, other toxics, uh, and then, of course, climate change. Um, and uh, we, as an organization, uh, were also involved in the coalition of organizations that came together um, advocating for uh, healthy recovery from 
um, from COVID. So advocating for um, an economic stimulus package that invests in um, green infrastructure and green jobs. And that would really um, bring these two um, pieces of work together. I guess that. Thank you again. Great, thank you. And it's so lovely to have your little one with us as well. Um, Brianna Brown is on the advisory committee of Indigenous Climate Action. And Brianna, if you could take a minute to introduce yourself uh, and tell us a little bit about what brings you to this conversation. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you so much. Um, my name is Brianna Brown and I am Inuk and Mi'kmaq from Happy Valley Goose Bay, Labrador. Um, I'm a lamb a Labrador land protector and I came up with the idea to promote um, land back to advocate for sovereignty and indigenous peoples as well as black and indigenous peoples and people of color um, communities and land ownership as a means of environmental protection. Uh, the logo of land back acted as a statement to stimulate indigenous economy as many indigenous land protectors across the world use the logo on traditional clothing, blankets, jewelry, and other um, artwork. Um, I believe it's important to participate in advocating for the rights of women, indigenous people's issues, environmental justice, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, persons living with disabilities, um, food security among indigenous communities, and anti-human trafficking. Um, I attended the student energy conferences in Calgary, Alberta and in the London, UK in the past um, two years, um, as well as the mentorship program where I met many Indigenous leaders from across Canada and learned about renewable and sustainable energy practices. Um, I also attended the National Roundtable on the Overrepresentation of Incarcerated Indigenous Youth where I spoke with council members of the Youth Justice um, and strate Strategic Initiative section with the Government of Canada um, and provided advice on how to help reduce the overrepresentation of incarcerated Indigenous youth based on my own experience as a survivor of violence. And um, my personal mission is to bring awareness to the growing issue of human trafficking to aid in the prevention of the national crisis concerning missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, plus through effective advocacy and expanding my knowledge throughout my life in order to make spaces for Indigenous peoples to feel safe in society. And my vision is um, to be a good role model for my community by providing my insights regarding social justice issues, intergenerational trauma affecting Indigenous communities, climate justice, systemic racism, and cultural revitalization. And I am also um, a team member with Anuk Sheik and a model for Anuk Sheik. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. It's really, and I knew this before we started, but it's really fabulous to have such um, a breadth of experience and so many different backgrounds and, and um, such passionate uh, women around the table as well. Um, so we're going to jump into um, a number of questions um, that I trust that all the panelists have had a chance to look at and, uh, and think on a little bit uh, before we open it to the floor to questions from participants. Uh, given that some of you have already spoken a little bit in your introductions about some of the key areas of overlap between climate change and poverty in Canada, I'm going to ask perhaps that you consider that question alongside the second question, which is, could you share with us how you and your organization are organizing or advocating at the intersection of climate and poverty? Um, Tika, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting, actually, listening to the other panelists reflect on what brings them to this conversation. And I was, I was thinking, you know, you invited me as a representative from Climate Action Network, but so much of what I and bringing to this conversation today really stems from the breadth of life experience that that I think each of us brings here. Um, so thinking about how all these issues intersect in the very place where I live and affect family members and have affected me in my own life. Um, yeah, it's just very interesting to think about the intersections of the personal and the organizational <laughs> through this conversation. Um, and I think that that's maybe a good a good 
jumping off point to talk about the just recovery work that uh, Climate Action Network has been doing. So I mentioned it in my intro that Climate Action Network has been involved in this just recovery work this year. Um, but maybe I'll give a little bit of background on that first, um, because I think that sets up part of the discussion around how we all come to be talking together today. Um, so early in the, the COVID crisis um, earlier this year, as, a, as the hub of a large network, we recognized that the economic lockdowns and the health crisis were going to have multiple adverse impacts on the members in our network and the communities they serve, which is really all the way across the country. Um, so way back in March, we started talking with two of our close allies, um, which happened to be the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment and 350.org. Um, and together, our three organizations hosted an open call for civil society that we, we held on April 3rd. And this was to talk about this unique moment in history. So not just to talk about the moment of the crisis, but to think about how we might use it as a catalyst to bring people together, bring communities and organizations together, and try to respond in a thoughtful and, and pr productive way. Um, so it emerged with a massive civil society collaboration that over the period of about six weeks produced six shared principles to guide a just recovery from the pandemic and, and the associated crises. Nearly 200 people contributed to drafting six principles and we launched them in late May. And since then about six, uh, close to 600 groups have endorsed them. Um, and these are groups across the spectrum. So not just climate organizations, not just environmental organizations, but all of civil society. So the six principles are to put people's health and well-being first with no exceptions, to strengthen the social safety net and provide relief directly to people, to prioritize the needs of workers and communities, to build resilience to prevent future crises, to build solidarity and equity across communities, generations and borders, and to uphold Indigenous rights and work in partnership with Indigenous peoples. And you can find all of the Just Recovery principles and a lot of information about this on justrecoveryforall.ca. That's the English website. Um, since that time, this Just Recovery Coalition or the groups that it brought together have continued to talk with one another and find ways of trying to work in solidarity. So we've um, we've done webinars on anti uh, anti or anti-poverty is the one we're doing today. We've also done an anti-racism training. We've done outreach work around migrant rights and migrant justice. Um, and, and it just continues to grow because we recognize that the, the social justice problems that each of our organizations work on aren't in isolation. They're all interconnected. Um, and this network has and this coalition has really helped to grow out that base of support. Um, so I think that the main way that we're continuing to tackle this is through that just recovery network um, and to try to uphold and uplift the messaging that comes out from the different sector experts. So in this case, with the Dignity for All campaign, we're just really happy to try to um, communicate the work that those partners are doing and to lend our support where we can, um, but also to use the messaging that's coming out of that coalition to better inform our own practices and think more intentionally about the ways that we undertake the work that we do. Great, thank you. Um, I'm inclined because of the collaboration there to let Katie or Samantha pick up uh, off of Tika there. Who would like to go next? All right, Samantha, you're up. Sure. Uh, I'd actually like to just backtrack um, uh, back to that first question about um, the intersection of poverty and, and climate change. Um, I mean, we all agreed that it exists, but uh, just to, to give it some specificity, um, I think taking a health lens can really be helpful and it can also be helpful in our advocacy. So um, basically we know that people who are living in poverty are much more at risk of poor health outcomes. Um, and uh, income is actually the single most uh, important determinant of health. So people who are living in poverty are 50% more likely to have heart disease and lung disease, 75% more likely to, to suffer from mental illness. Um, and actually income inequality in itself is also linked to poor health outcomes on a population level. So we know that like that in a, a jurisdiction that has higher rates of poverty um, and there's higher income inequality, we have worse health outcomes. And then we also know, of course, that um, 
the health effects of climate change are are much more um, felt in in people living in poverty. So people who are living in poverty because they already have these underlying health issues are more at risk of health uh, adverse effects. Um, for example, exacerbation of heart and lung disease when there are forest fires, uh, exacerbation of lung disease when there's increased um, pollution due to increased temperatures. Um, and also people who are living in poverty are, are less able to adapt to climate change. So um, they're unable to afford, for example, an air conditioning unit or to move or repair housing that's been damaged from a flood or a forest fire. People are less food secure and we know that there's going to be increased food insecurity with climate change and there already is in many places. Um, and also um, people are much more likely to be engaged in precarious work, work that's outdoors and um, more difficult with increased heat um, and also people who are living in poverty have less access to green space. So, so I think that, that if we think about it in terms of health, um, and also the Canadian public really likes to think about things in terms of health, then that can really illustrate how the, the two issues truly are intersected. Um, and that also brings us to, to how we can um, resolve both issues, and that's working at solutions that can uh, improve both poverty and climate change. And that's where we land at the healthy recovery or the green recovery. So we're, we're addressing both issues at once. And really, as I think Katie and both, both Katie and Tika already mentioned, we're actually addressing underlying systems level issues, capitalism <laughs> and, um, and racism and um, all those other things that are, that are caught leading to poverty and leading to climate change. Um, and uh, I think I, really, I already mentioned, and, and Tika already mentioned the work that CAPE has done on the, on the just recovery. Um, and we were happy to, co to contribute uh, to, the, to that work that was done at the network. Um, and also we brought in some health organizations, again, to, to help with this framing. So for example, the Canadian Medical Association signed on to a letter um, to the federal government asking for this. Uh, green, just, uh, healthy recovery, uh, along with several other health organizations. I'll, I'll pass it along now. Thank you. And I, I think it's probably worth noting, um, or I, 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 I'm going to bring us into this tent too. At Citizens for Public Justice, we were really pleased to participate in the development of those six principles. And I know that ICA, Indigenous Climate Action, was also there. And as Tika said, such a breadth of experience. Uh, Katie, I'll pass it back to you now to... Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I've, I'm already, I'm really vibing with what folks are saying. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll start with what we're working on right now and how I think that fits in with, um, fits in with uh, both poverty and climate change. So our team uh, recently launched a campaign called Defund TMX, defundtmx.ca, and um, you can go check it out. And this was really coming off of the heels of, of being involved in that um, the Just Recovery Coalition work. And I think, you know, I, there are writers that I've been uh, really looking to for guidance in this moment. Uh, one of them is Aratundi Roy. Um, and uh, she talks about how p the pandemic is a portal. And also, like, in this moment, we really need to be um, thinking of solutions and also holding people accountable. And you know, one of the things that has become, well, I mean, I think one, one of the things we could definitely have anticipated at the start of COVID is that when crisis hits, um, that there's kind of dual forces at play. There's the forces for good, like all of those 500 organizations that are coming together to put this vision forward for the future. There are people helping their neighbors, making sure they have what they need, that they're checked in on. You know, you know, people organizing food banks and, and different things like that. Um, and then there are also the forces at play that are trying to make sure that um, stimulus spending is being thrown at fossil fuel companies and pharmaceutical companies and, um, you know, really lining the big pockets of corporations and consolidating power. And so when you know, we're really at this point now where we've set that vision out and are needing to really take a look at, okay, where, what are the dollars and cents of this um, COVID, like COVID crisis and how is it really landing? And I think, you know, in a lot of ways, the, 
and we'll get to this later on, there's so many things to celebrate about how uh, social movements have come together in this moment and the things that we've won. And also uh, the kind of tendencies of our old systems are still here, they're still operating. And so one of the things we really wanted to look at was um, this historical fight that we've been a part of, uh, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, formerly the Kinder Morgan Pipeline that the government bought for four point six or seven billion dollars. Um, and whether or not the government's actually going to move forward on a, a pipeline project that they now own and have paid for through public money, um, are they going to move forward with that within a context of, you know, people really struggling, uh, really needing federal and provincial level support to be able to get through this crisis? Um, are they going to be throwing public money towards those kind of projects, or are they going to really double down on this build back better narrative that they're talking about? And if we're going to build back better, that definitely does not include spending upwards possibly of $20 billion to get that pipeline built. Um, instead, that money should be going to the things that we that were in our vision for a Green New Deal and that are in our vision now for a just recovery from this crisis. And that includes, you know, um, making sure that migrant workers have permanent status and the support they need to be able to do their jobs safely. Uh, some of the biggest COVID outbreaks have been on, in migrant work camps. Um, you know, that, that funding should be going to our long-term care facilities where we've also seen outbreaks. We've absolutely impoverished the places where our elders go in their last days. And um, that should be where public money should be spent, not on a pipeline company. So we really want to both celebrate um, this vision that we've put forward for a just recovery and in the way that we do also really hold, um, you know, leaders like Justin Trudeau uh, and others who are talking about how important uh, investing in the public good is while also trying to quietly channel money towards the fossil fuel industry. So we really want to call that into question. And I think this moment um, is really an important one to be, um, to be telling that story of what people's lived experiences are and how our governments are, um, you know, acting on our behalf, um, sometimes in really great ways and sometimes not, and, and really making sure that we hold their feet to the fire when they're not. Um, so that's one of the ways that I think our team has really decided we want to, um, yeah, defend the need to be investing in the public good. And of course, um, the backdrop of uh, the campaign to, to defund TMX is this many, many year struggle that has been led by um, indigenous communities all along the pipeline route from Alberta to BC. Uh, and so really supporting that, um, the struggle for sovereignty and, and to recognize those rights as well. That's really the historical context that we're sitting, uh, that we're situating it in as well. So I don't know, <laughs> I kind of went in a roundabout way, but I hope that answers the question. And then I think I, just on the last, uh, just the last point for me to kind of round this out is like, I think that, you know, this is the moment where we need to be connecting all of the different interwoven crises together to be able to create that kind of common front because I, the climate movement knows it doesn't, it's, we're not going to win if we are trying to only advocate on single issue ideas. We don't have enough people to win. We don't have enough people to tip the scales if we're only asking people who are um, coming from a climate only and climate first perspective to be in our movement. We actually have to be making those connections so that we have the kind of alliance and people power needed to stand up to the forces at play that are trying to get money towards corporations and, you know, big interests. So um, I think for me, just seeing the emergence of the Green New Deal in the United States and that like really thoughtful vision and pathway to get there of, you know, that transformative visionary future is what's really exciting for me because it lets go of all of the, the those pretenses about how we have to be focused and stay in our lane and really invites us and challenges us to, to bust down those barriers. Fantastic. Thanks, Kitty. 
Uh, Brianna, there's, uh, there's so much in there that I want to invite you to pick up on, but I also uh, invite you to share your own perspectives on the, the key areas of overlap and the ways that ICA is engaged. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, in regards to my work in anti-human trafficking and my experience, um, a key area that certainly overlaps between climate change and poverty in Canada is the issue of violence towards women. Um, in my work with the Labrador land protectors, um, I was on a Zoom call with the land protectors two weeks ago um, to bring up the issue of mega dams and pollution in our waters and animals um, along the Churchill River. Um, and we met with NDP leader Jagmeet Singh and his assistants. Um, and I would like to read you what I had said during that meeting. Um, I said, I have been impacted personally by the effects of the Mus Muscat Falls mega dam due to an economic downfall in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador as socioeconomic and political factors have been proven to influence the increase in racism. I've experienced this racism after being hit by a vehicle while attending university. In my attempts to access healthcare in, Newf in Newfoundland, each attempt was unsuccessful as the doctors sent me home assuming I was drunk or high, um, just because I am native, but also because I was hit by the car, um, I had trouble breathing and um, the car had hit me in my hip so that I was imbalanced in my walking. So because of that, um, the dizziness from not being able to breathe as well as the imbalance in my walking, they just assumed that I was either drunk or high. Um, after about eight times of trying to be seen by a doctor, I was frightened that the doctor would refer me to a psychiatric hospital. At the time, I was taking the Women in Law, women in Law in Canada course, where I had read that many women who end up in jail become incarcerated due to the fact that psychiatric hospitals are often underfunded and overpopulated. Therefore, the next place they would go for treatment is jail. Um, and last year I spoke with the council members of the Youth Justice and Strategic Initiative sec section of the Government of Canada while attending the National Roundtable on the Overrepresentation of Incarcerated Indigenous Youth, where I expressed that about 87% of incarcerated women in Canada have a traumatic brain injury. Um, and in my work currently in anti-human trafficking um, and environmental justice with the Indigenous Climate Action Steering Committee, um, I have found that the loss of Indigenous culture due to environmental racism is directly related to the issue of human trafficking in Canada, uh, which had been increasing with Indigenous women being the highest population human trafficked, um, and therefore the loss of Indigenous culture due to environmental racism is in turn directly related to the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls plus. Um, so we would like to have more meetings scheduled with, um, with Jagmeet Singh and his assistants to um, find more solutions on how we could address the pollution that the mega dams are creating in the Churchill River. Um, I also believe that there must be um, a policy to address the issue in particular with um, moving forward in the fight against human trafficking and ind indigenous women in Canada as there are many socioeconomic and political factors that come together to create very vulnerable circumstances in the lives of Indigenous women, which in, in turn allows for the space for the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls to be a present national crisis in our society. Um, that's what I have so far. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's plenty. Um, again, just uh, I'm really struck by the the vastness of the experience and also the all of the threads that are that are coming together against uh, between what all four of you have said and we're going to head into a little bit of a lightning round um, through which we'll address maybe one or possibly two questions um, I think a lot has been said about the the just recovery movement and the principles that have come from that and the way that it's informed a lot of the work that's being done across civil society right now and the question then is what more is needed uh, to overcome public perceptions and a lot of the political framing uh, that that sort of pit climate action and addressing poverty against one another so how do we how do we bridge that gap in a way that uh, will help us demonstrate political will and a, and a real uh, call for action 
to address these multiple crises. Uh, Brianna, do you want to start first this time? Sure. Um, yeah, I like what I said. I was thinking that something that would be really important in um, regarding policy that could be created. I was thinking of like a policy um, for moving forward in the fight against human trafficking and in indigenous women. Um, I am Enoch as well as Migma, um, and I have found that in Inuits are the most human trafficked population in our society, and I feel that that is something that needs to be addressed um, through the lens of Inuit in particular, as well as Indigenous women in particular. Um, as we have different cultures, and due to those differences in our cultures, there are different ways in which we can be discriminated against, um, especially in terms of what agreements our governments have with our, um, what agreements our governments have with uh, the land and with the, gov with the federal government, um, as well as us as people. And I think that creating a policy in particular through our own lens would be very important um, to address the, these issues of human trafficking um, in relation to environmental racism. Great, thank you. Katie. Uh, thank you. And yeah, I'm gonna, I think I'll pick up on a thread uh, that's coming up for me uh, with what Brianna has just said is that I, you know, I think we're, I think we're gonna see two different pathways emerge. Um, and it, in relation to the ways that political leaders respond to this crisis. I was just looking at the news this morning um, and saw that Jason Kenney has uh, cut 11,000 Alberta health services jobs to save $600 million annually um, in, you know, in jobs that are, let me just see here, jobs that are uh, laboratory jobs, food service jobs, laundry jobs, and housekeeping jobs, which seem like uh, the absolute critical work that we would need uh, to be happening in um, hospitals in this moment um, and outsourcing them uh, so that, you know, when they be outsourced, the, the working conditions are worsened, um, the stipulations and, you know, controls are, are lessened. Um, so I think there's that pathway forward. Um, and then there's the alternative, which is, um, you know, actually heavily investing in uh, our uh, hospital services or other kinds of services. And um, definitely in a time of crisis, we've seen this play out in the past, um, or definitely in a time where there's been a call for austerity, which we've certainly heard, and which is definitely what uh, Jason Kenney is responding to uh, by making those cuts. Um, in the past, we've seen what that's done. So when Stephen Harper was trying to, um, you know, cut down on this like big government spending, uh, he, the first things that were cut were supports for women, uh, supports for Indigenous youth and Indigenous communities, um, healthcare spending, uh, education spending, the things that we need so much, especially in this moment, as we head into, uh, in a lot of places, the second wave of COVID, as CERB benefits, are going to are being cut off and people are going to be moving towards uh, more precarity in their households and their homes um, and as we'll see like that we're going to have less and less jobs as we head into winter when the economy tends to uh, stagnate a little bit more um, and so I think again it, it, I'm just reiterating what I've said before is that I, I really believe that um, we need to continue that kind of alliance type of organizing that we've, we've made happen through the Just Recovery Coalition and that we did through Green New Deal organizing and just really making sure that we bring in, especially climate organizations, bring in um, race and class frameworks to the work that we're doing. Um, as a starting point, uh, some, and I, I know it's a, a resource from the United States, but it's definitely one that um, has spoken to me and that um, organizations like um, the Movement for Black Lives and um, the Sunrise Movement in the U.S. have employed is called um, uh, race class narratives, 
action. And so it's really thinking about the way that we communicate about climate work uh, in a way that ensures that um, people across uh, racial and class backgrounds can see themselves in climate organizing work. And if we can't communicate about the work that we're doing through a race class lens because there isn't one in our work, I think we need to deeply evaluate the kind of climate work that we're doing. If it's not serving uh, racialized uh, people or it's only serving people who can afford uh, an electric vehicle, then it's probably not the kind of sleeping climate solution that we need. Great, thanks for that, Katie. I wanna leave a couple of minutes before we wrap up for questions from participants. Uh, but uh, Samantha, do you have anything you'd like to add in terms of how we continue to bridge that gap? Um, I just feel like I have to address uh, Brianna's story uh, as a physician. Unfortunately, her story is, as we know, representative of many experiences in healthcare in Canada. And um, we need to be addressing anti-Indigenous, anti-Black racism, like in general. And specifically, I know that we have work in, in healthcare to uh, address anti-Indigenous and anti-Black racism that exists in the healthcare system. Um, and, and, you know, the organization that I'm a part of, um, uh, like the, at St. Michael's Hospital in downtown Toronto, thankfully we are, doing some of that work. Dr. Janet Smiley is an Indigenous family physician who's been leading a lot of that work. Um, and I, but I think that it, there's a long way to go. And, and we know that in addressing climate change, we also need to be thinking, as Katie was saying, about addressing um, climate injustice and, and, and racism. Um, but thankfully, I think to, to lift, to, to be on a lighter note or a happier note, um, uh, we know that the solutions to climate change um, will improve health, and we know that the solutions to poverty will improve health. Um, thankfully, like the the two are are intersecting um, and aligned. And I mean, I can give some examples. Like we know that if we improve access to public transportation, that's going to address climate change, and people who are living in poverty will will see the most improvement in their lives and in their health. Um, there are other examples, if we invest in, in um, active transportation, if we invest in better food security, uh, we know that health will improve and we'll be addressing climate change at the same time. Um, and I think, of course, like the, the work that all of our organizations have been doing in, in these times of COVID around a just recovery are addressing all of these issues. Great, thank you. Uh, Tika. Over to you, and then we'll, um, just a reminder to folks, to, if you have questions, uh, to drop them into the Q&A box so that we can put them to the panelists. Um, but for Stika, what, do you, what would you like to let us know? Yeah, I think all the comments we've heard so far are, are spot on. Um, I think the one thing that comes to mind for me is that one of the big I guess gaps or areas where we need a, a bit more focus or a lot more focus, I suppose, um, is on communications. Um, so not just uh, continuing the dialogue here, but like spreading it more widely um, among people who maybe aren't part of the fold yet, who either aren't in the climate movement or aren't typically thinking about the issues that as we're thinking about them. So, I mean, we know that climate change is a complex systems problem, as is poverty um, and mm -hmm. healthcare and racism. All these things are part of the same complex systems problem. And one of the key challenges is to be able to communicate this complexity clearly and accessibly to the public. And so also to communicate what action steps are needed to travel the pathway to successfully meeting the climate change challenge or the poverty reduction challenge or the racism challenge and the ways that they're integrated together. Um, so I think that that communication work takes a lot of different forms. Um, part of it is about breaking into mainstream media and being able to actually see our stories reflected um, and, and to like raise these through storytelling. That's really important. Um, but I think also reflecting on what Katie had said about alliance building. One of the things that we regularly talk about at Climate Action Network is people ask us what's the most important step or what are some the top 10 most important steps to take as an individual to promote climate action. And every single time, the number one thing that we recommend is that you talk about it, that 
you make this part of normal discussion, you bring it up in normal discourse with people who aren't necessarily right within your bubble. Um, and so it helps to build out an understanding, but it also just helps to normalize it and make it a part of the public consciousness. Um, and I think that as we do that, as we talk about climate justice and we talk about those intersections with race and class um, and, and just continue to normalize the conversation, I think that really helps to communicate um, both the depth of the crisis, the urgency that's involved, but also helps people to feel more welcome to participate in solutions. So I, I think that's my main point that I just want to drive home that communicating, talking, building relationships, that's how we win. We win by building accountability and trust among one another. Um, and we do that by being real and being human and talking face to face at, or over Zoom as the times require, but like actually having human heart led conversations with one another. Thanks, Tika. I think that's a really fabulous way to, to sort of sum it up because I, I agree that it all comes back to relationships with in our movements, across our movements, and then with those uh, who have more power to create to create change. Um, we actually have a couple of questions, both on the issue of uh, basic income, and they come with thanks to all of you for the presentations that you've given. Um, interest in your views on how a universal basic income could alleviate concerns among working people about loss of jobs as we move towards a sustainable and just economy that degrows environmentally destructive aspects of the economy, like fossil fuels, and moves us toward a steady state economy. Anybody want to take that one up? All right, Tika, go I ahead. I guess I can start. I can start on this one. Um, so I guess I'll preface by saying that my comments aren't necessarily reflective of the organization that I'm representing right now, because we. <laughs> we're a climate organization and we haven't made a specific policy statement on universal basic income. Um, so, you know, we've endorsed some of the member organizations and allies open letters and things that have come about that advocate for universal basic income. So broadly speaking, it's a position that we support. Um, but I think speaking just from my own personal experience and somewhat anecdotally, it is absolutely critically important that people have that basic security of income in order to be able to fully participate in in having agency over decision making problem solving having the freedom to be able to make those discretionary decisions about how they spend their energy their time and their resources um, and I, I think it's absolutely unconscionable that so many people that I'm sure this is true of all of us on this panel, but so many people that I know and love and care about spend a disproportionate amount of their time worrying just about making ends meet, about making those basic elements of their lives come together so that they're not living in constant jeopardy. So whether it's facing jeopardy of eviction from their home, facing like the homelessness, um, facing loss of income if they have to balance the needs of family versus their career, facing food insecurity and food shortages. Like there, these are things that impact people around me constantly all the time and it makes them unavailable to be participants in, I guess what is sort of seen as like a higher level problem that's, that's inaccessible to them um, fighting the climate crisis. When in fact, the very things that are putting them back and holding them back are the same things that are perpetuating cli the climate crisis and preventing us from stopping it. <laughs> so, Katie, I guess you're up Thank next. You. Yeah, Katie. Yeah, this one is one that I, um, I definitely grapple with. And I think similarly, we are team at uh, 350 in Canada. We, have a, we don't have a per position on universal basic income. I think for me, like a lot of policy, I, like policy ideas, I, I try to always remind myself that um, one single piece of policy is not a silver bullet for what we face. And I really worry, um, I sometimes worry in this, this time, uh, if we like really focus on one policy prescription, it could, um, 
it can derail uh, some of the other really great work that's going on. And I think I, I'm, I saw recently uh, Spring Magazine do a really good uh, kind of hot take on um, universal basic income. And I think one of the things that um, really resonated with me in terms of that is that, yes, we need to make sure that people have a secure source of income. Is universal basic income it? I'm personally not sure, and I'm not an expert on universal basic income. What I do know is that we need social supports for vulnerable communities, and that comes for me, first and foremost, in the form of community services, programs, resources that are for the public good, for the community's good. And so for me, um, I, I feel less drawn towards the conversation about should we, should everyone get X amount of money per week or should we have, um, you know, universal pharmacare? Should we have 10 days paid sick leave? Should we, like, should we have these kind of like um, services that are, you know, accessible to the community at large? So I don't know if that really answers the question. Again, I'm not an expert on universal basic income, but I feel like where we where we focus in on universal in basic income, we um, let go of the the kinds of services that are needed community wide. And so, yeah, I'm I'm a little bit stuck on it too. I would love to hear what other panelists think. And my my mind isn't made up about it. Um, so yeah, just happy to hear what other people think about it. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I think that the rest of that conversation um, will be one um, uh, that we'll need to continue. Fortunately, we're all in overlapping networks now, and that's something we can continue to explore together. Um, uh, it's also is worth noting, though, that um, the basic income, it doesn't necessarily have to be either basic income or universal pharmacare. There could be models where, where it's all brought together. Um, so I think that there's, there's, there's lots that can be explored. Um, and I think this just also points to um, really the, the ongoing nature of this work that we're doing together across, uh, across sectors so that Maybe we in the climate movement need more conversation with those in the basic income movement, for example. Uh, before we wrap it up, because I know that several of you uh, panelists need to be finished uh, right at one o'clock Eastern, we have a specific question for Brianna. Uh, and that is, what do you believe social workers can do in working with uh, indigenous people to work towards creating change? Uh, and I'm not 100% sure, I'm not sure if the questioner wants to clarify if this is in, the healthcare context specifically, or just maybe what, it, broadly speaking, is the role of social workers in Indigenous justice? Um, I think it's really important to understand um, definitely the culture of Indigenous peoples, but we have many different cultures. Um, and I think it's also important to make sure not to view um, Indigenous people in a pan-Indigenous view when working with them in social work. Um, I also think it is really, really important to understand um, not only the cultural background, but also um, the background of the intergenerational trauma and how that could cause perhaps um, blood memory or blood trauma of certain traumas that have not necessarily have had to have happened to you for you to have that trauma, but it could have been something that your grandparent had experienced, say for example, in residential school, um, that still somehow is able to trigger yourself um, subconsciously. I think that's very, very important, um, knowing the triggers for sure. As a person who had lived in a transition home, as a shelter, I had noticed that it's um, very, very, very important to um, be extremely compassionate in the care that you give to the women that you're helping, the people that you're helping within those um, spaces. And I think it's also really important to um, create spaces for the most vulnerable people to be granted like a safe space to address the unique intersections within the colonial, colonial violence and discrimination that our vulnerable populations face on a daily basis. 
because if they don't feel comfortable or you do not hold that space within yourself to be able to um, allow that person to address what has been um, bothering them or oppressing them, then you, you don't allow them for any space to grow. You, you know, if you are putting your preconceived notions or ideals um, based on your own culture on another person, you may not, um, you might be, you may not be aware of that, but you also in doing so, you may be um, taking up space where they could be using that to let you know what really is bothering them and affecting their mental health or physical health, things like that. I think that's important for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. It is one o'clock. It's amazing. Um, I think we could have used two or three hours and still had lots to say. Um, I just, I do want to give Natalie a minute to speak a little bit more about you on this and the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty and some of the other webinars that are coming up. But first, I just wanted to say thank you to Katie, Samantha, Tika, Brianna. My apologies that I mispronounced your name the first, the first time I introduced you. Names matter. Um, we do have some questions that are still coming in in terms of how we can move forward in a good way that doesn't um, that allows us to hold on to the lessons from this current moment. So I'm going to share some of those by email with uh, panelists afterwards, uh, and I think um, we can continue this conversation. So thank you to our four panelists for all of the um, information and insights that you shared. Um, yes, please drop um, your information, your campaigns, all of that stuff um, into the chat. Uh, Tika, I'll see you at that other meeting in a couple of minutes. Uh, but first, Natalie, could you um, join us uh, on screen to share a little bit more about what people can look to this week? Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, Carrie, and thanks to all our panelists. Uh, I understand that some of our panelists need to run, so um, they may disappear, but please stay with us just for a little while longer. And I'll just share a little bit about uh, Dignity for All and our Chew on This campaign, which is happening right now, which uh, we're excited this year to, um, to work a little bit more intentionally cross-sectorally with folks from the climate movement, for example, um, with uh, Indigenous and Black-led organizations. Um, our Chew on This campaign has always been about ending poverty in Canada. For seven years, we called for a national anti-poverty plan that was based in human rights and that was comprehensive in nature, so it worked across those silos. In 2018, uh, the federal government released their poverty reduction strategy, uh, which was um, a good step in the right direction, um, along with the national housing strategy, but it certainly wasn't the plan that we had proposed or that we had called for. So much work remains to be done. Um, but this year we took, uh, we pivoted a little bit in, in our campaign, um, partly in terms of our engagement strategy, since this used to be a postcard campaign, which uh, as everyone can understand had to, shift a little bit since we can't ask people to go out into their communities and distribute postcards this year, um, but also in terms of our asks. So we've had some really rich discussions with folks about um, what asks, what should we be asking for as a campaign and making sure that it actually is meaningful, that it resonates with people who experience poverty and who are disproportionately affected by poverty in this country. And so um, this year, um, through that consultation and, and through our participation in the uh, principles of a just recovery, we really zoned in on our common ground, our common, um, our common asks with regards to um, the equity that underlies all these issues. So we've specifically called for a look at um, at the communities that are disproportionately affected both by poverty and climate change, for example, and by violence, as Brianna has mentioned too. And so all these forms of, of injustice uh, coming through systemic colonialism, through anti-Black racism, uh, through homophobia, through any kind of heteropatriarchy, um, we, we recognize that these, there are systems at play and that the ways that our programs, our, our laws were designed um, themselves are flawed. And so we cannot expect them to fix our problems today when they themselves are part of the problem. So 
in while we are still focusing on poverty specifically with this campaign we're really excited to work uh, across the across sectors with a variety of people because we recognize that um, at the core we want the same things and often um, and Carrie's first question kind of alluded to this often in in the policy sphere or uh, government relations climate activists and anti-poverty activists and indigenous rights activists get pitted almost against each other as having competing asks that we're all competing for this money that seems to be in short supply. Well, we've seen that when there's a will, there's a way. We've seen that when governments feel that the public sentiment is behind them, that there is a way to get help where it's needed. And so what we are calling on all people um, now to show is that there is a will for the government to find a way to address these underlying issues so that we can build equity and we can do it sustainably. So uh, for our campaign this year, I'm going to share my screen right now and just show you our, our campaign website here. Um, if it will let me, one moment. So um, I'm going to take you to our campaign website and I'm just going to walk you quickly through our asks and our calls to action, which you can do. So I'm not going to read through everything, but you can visit us at chewonthis.ca or we also have this available in French at marsa.ca um, and we have some online tools that make it really easy for you to send a message to your member of parliament, uh, to your local newspaper. We have an e-rally coming up this Saturday which is October 17th, the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. So we have an e-rally that we know that we will have some representatives from the federal government at, um, and we have a great panel lined up there. So what we are asking for this year that we felt were common across different sectors are again, basing this in, in a human rights framework. And, uh, and with that, I, I also specifically include indigenous rights and, and sovereignty. So our first ask is, that the government simply fulfill their legal obligation to protect people's rights to an adequate standard of living and end poverty in Canada by the year 2030. That's consistent with the Sustainable Development Goals. This is something that Canada has already agreed that they should be doing. So our first ask is basically that um, you fulfill the promise that you've already made, um, that there's a legal and a moral obligation to protect people's right to an adequate standard of living. And that encompasses all kinds of other uh, specific rights below. Uh, recognizing that the same groups of people tend to be just proportionally affected um, by systemic oppression, by poverty, um, we have asked for specific targets for those communities specifically. So uh, that's a lot of the use of the term specific, but um, that's what we want to get. So we want these targets to be at minimum consistent with uh, our human rights obligations uh, with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and Sustainable Development Goals. And we also want these targets to be set in consultation and in collaboration with these communities. So we don't just need, for example, a target that looks at the poverty line, but we need targets that look at health and well-being. We need targets that look, look at housing. We need targets that look at employment. Um, and uh, in, in green jobs, we need targets that look at um, retrofitting um, homes, um, looking at access to vehicles that are, that are less polluting. So um, our specific targets is our second ask. And then thirdly, we need to prioritize the funding for strategies that actually reduce poverty and improve measures of well-being and equity among these communities. So we want to understand which programs are actually having an impact to shrink the gap in income inequality and other forms of socioeconomic um, inequity. And uh, so to do that, we need disaggregated data that tells us what's happening, what's, what's the impact of these programs. And again, we need meaningful consultation and collaboration with the communities uh, directly involved and who are uh, disproportionately affected. So um, this includes both universal um, publicly funded programs such as pharmacare, uh, such as dental care, child care, um, 
subsidized housing. Um, we have suggested guaranteed basic income as one spoke in the wheel, so to speak, um, because we recognize that the uh, social assistance rates across our country are abysmal and um, it's a fractured and broken system in, in dire need of repair. Um, but we also recognize that this needs to include specific community-led strategies, similar to what Brianna was talking about, that we can't just say, well, we need something for Indigenous people and then assume that it's a one-size-fits-all uh, solution there. So we need to make sure that, again, that the people who are most uh, directly affected by these policy decisions have a say in how these policies and programs are designed, how they're implemented, how they're monitored, and how we evaluate them. So we need that, um, that consultation, but also that ongoing accountability. So those are our three main asks for our campaign this year. And you can visit our website to take action. And we'd love to, um, we'd love to have you send your letter. You can send that letter in English, in French, or in Inuktitut. In, in you can send it online or by um, downloading it and mailing it in. If you are reaching out to other people in your community who don't have access to digital technology or internet, you can, um, you can print that off and collect signatures the old fashioned way we'll say. So we do uh, invite you to check it out and spread the word. Um, the campaign will be live for this week and the following week. So in that time, we'd love to get as many letters in as possible. Uh, again, just to show, uh, to show our government just how many people um, are on board with this and, and want to see this kind of change. So that's, um, that's all I have to share today. And again, I want to thank all of our panelists and for Carrie for moderating. Um, Carrie or anyone else, do you have any last words? I just wanted to ask, I've dropped the, uh, the links to the two on this in the chat. Please make sure I've done so correctly, Natalie, because I don't want to send people to the wrong place. Um, uh, Katie, uh, Brianna, Samantha, if there's anything, do you have one final action you want to encourage people to take? Um, or will it all just be send letters via chew on this? Brianna, go ahead. I just wanted to say that I support everything that you guys are saying in this whole entire um, webinar, the whole thing. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I think that this is very progressive. And I think that the work that you guys are doing needs to certainly continue for sure. And I really love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for being a part of it. Yeah, likewise, learned so much from you all during this webinar and appreciate the work that you all are doing at Citizens for Public Justice and uh, looking forward to seeing people out on the streets uh, when it's safe to do so. Great, thanks Katie. Samantha, are you still there with us? Yes, thank you so much for having Oh, fantastic. Thanks for being here. And thanks, Natalie, for pulling us all together. Thanks to all uh, who have joined uh, to participate in today's discussion. I think there's going to be a lot of conversations that are going to continue um, among the panelists and hopefully among participants as well. Thanks to everybody for sharing your contact information. Uh, and there are lots. Please have a look at the webinar schedule for the rest of the week. There's a lot more going on that I think we'll touch on. Uh, some of the issues that we've looked at today, as well as another, uh, a range of others as well. So thank you very much and um, have a great day. Thanks everyone. And just uh, so you know, we will make this webinar recording available uh, in a few days. So you can watch for that on our, to on this website. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye.